over Unit 4, which is mostly talking about finance, banking, stuff like that. When you tell people you're studying economics, they're going to normally think, oh, you're studying money, you're studying finance, you're trying to get rich. And for the most part, they're wrong. However, we do talk about that stuff because banking, finance, the monetary policy, etc., that's really important to our economy. It's a part of our circular flow model, and it impacts almost everyone. So we do talk about it in this unit. First, we want to talk about what is the financial sector. Hopefully you know it. It's basically just a network of institutions that link borrowers and lenders. So, for instance, banks, the stock exchange, things like that. An asset is simply something tangible or possibly intangible that has value. So, for instance, a house, car, stock. For me, it would be my computer, my phone. All of that is assets, something that has value to you. Liquidity is the ease with which an asset can be converted to a medium of exchange. So for instance, for so for instance, let's say I could sell my computer right now for $1000 to someone on Craigslist. Then my liquidity is really high because the ease with which I can convert my computer to a medium of exchange is really short. It's really high. Or I could say my car has a really low liquidity because it might take years or months to actually get all of my money from my car. So liquidity is just the ease with which an asset can be converted into money. Now, we've talked about interest rates in the past, but let's re-go over that. Interest rate is simply the amount a lender charges borrowers for borrowing money. So it's basically the price of a loan. So if I loan you $1,000, I want money for that. I want some sort of profit from that. If I have a 0% interest rate, that means I'm making no rate of return. So if I have, let's say, a 3% interest rate per year for a $1,000 loan, that means at the end of the year, let's say you didn't pay off your loan, you owe me about $30. That's simply me profiting off of giving you money. Now, we talked about nominal versus real GDP, but the same thing applies to interest rates. Nominal interest rate is basically the total interest rate, so here it's 9%. Real interest rate is the interest rate nominal, but it takes into account inflation. So in this example, nominal interest rate is 9%. But inflation is 5%, so 9 minus 5 gives us 4, our real interest rate. Now let's talk about our medium of exchange, money. In the past, we used to have the bartering system. Basically, we would exchange goods and services directly. So let's say I bought two goats for three bags of flour. There's a lot of different problems with the system. First of all, it's really slow and time consuming. I have to carry around three bags of flour just to buy two goats. It doesn't make any sense. Second, the person that has the two goats, they might not want flour. They might not need flour. Why do they want to trade three bags of flour for two goats? There's a lot of other problems too with the system. So to resolve this, we invented money. It's basically a way of making the barter system a lot better. It has three main advantages that you do need to know. First, it's a medium of exchange. Money can be used to buy goods and services with no real complications. So the person with the two goats, they might not want three bags of flour, but they would want money because you can exchange money for anything. If you have money, you could buy uh, gummy bears, you could buy a car, you could buy a house. You can't really do all that with three bags of flour, so money is a medium of exchange. Second, it's a unit of account, so it measures value. It measures the value of goods and services. So for instance, here, we don't know if two goats equals four bags of flowers, or one bag of flour, or 50 bags of flowers. We don't really know the value of any of these items. But with money, we do know that one goat's $50, or one chicken equals $10, etc. Money basically measures how valuable an item is. And then finally, it's a store of value. Money allows you to store purchasing power for the future, so you can save money in a bank or at your home and keep purchasing power for the future. With flour or goats, that's not necessarily always true. So there's two main types of money you need to know. There's fiat money. This serves as money but no, has no other uses. So paper money, coins, bitcoin, that's all fiat money. It's only used for a medium of exchange. Commodity money serves as money, but also serves as something else. So that's the bartering system. That's bags of flour. That's goats. But it also can be gold. It could be silver. It could be a lot of different things. Now, remember liquidity, the ease of which we can sell an item into money? Well, there's two different types of liquidity and how we measure it with money. M1 and M2. M1 is the highest form of liquidity. It's currency in circulation, so money, paper money, coins, etc., 
and checking accounts in a bank. M M2 is M1, so all of this, including saving deposits, time deposits, and money market funds. You don't necessarily need to know what all of this is, just need to memorize M1 is the highest liquidity, its currency and checking accounts. M2 includes M1, but also has savings deposits, time deposits, and money market funds. All of this is really important. I'm going to talk about banking. Hopefully you know what banking is. You, It's a basically a way to loan or save your money. But how exactly do banks work? Let's say I get $1,000. I give $1,000 to the bank. How exactly do they keep it safe? How exactly do they profit? How exactly do they make that system great? Well, it's through fractional reserve banking. Basically, banks hold only a portion of the deposits to cover potential withdrawals and then loans the rest of the money out. So the way that works, let's say I deposit $1,000 into the bank. The bank will keep a portion of that, maybe 20%, 10%, so then they'll keep $100. Then they'll loan out $900 to another individual. Using that system, the bank profits using interest rates, what we covered earlier, basically the cost of loaning out money, but also they're able to keep your money there and they're able to loan money out to the other individuals using fractional reserve banking. So how do they determine how much they're going to keep? That's by law. The law determines the reserve requirement ratio. The reserve requirement ratio is basically the proportion of money that a bank has to keep. So let's say it's 10%. That means if I deposit $1,000, a bank has to keep $100. The main reason we have this is to make sure that banks don't collapse. Let's say you deposit $1,000, but then you withdraw $950 later. Let's say the bank doesn't have that money because they didn't have reserve requirement ratio. Then the bank could possibly collapse. But... Let's say the reserve requirement ratio is 100% or 90% and they're forced to keep all the money that you deposit. Then the bank can't really operate or they can't really benefit the economy because they can't loan out money. So the, generally, a lower reserve requirement ratio means that the economy is going to grow more and more. But a higher reserve requirement ratio means that it's not going to grow as much, but it's more stable if that makes sense. Now, the main way we can actually calculate the money multiplier which is what we talked about in Unit 3, which is where when the government spends, let's say, $10 billion, but it benefits the economy $100 billion or maybe $200 billion, the way we calculate this is by using the reserve requirement ratio. It's using 1 divided by reserve requirement ratio. So if it's 0.1 or 10%, the money multiplier is 10x. So let's say that you deposit $100, that would generate $1,000 to the economy. Or if you have $1 in reserve, that generates $10 in total money. That's how we calculate the money multiplier. Now banks have what is called a balance sheet. You're going to see a lot of these in this unit. On this side, we have their assets, which is basically just what benefits them, what has, what they, has value to them. And then they have their liabilities. That's Liabilities are simply what they owe almost, what they're what they have to cover for instance let's say let's say i own a business that's losing 10 million dollars that would be a liability it's something that's holding me back almost so on the assets side we have loans basically people the money we owe or the money we're giving out reserves what we're having in reserve right now which is 500 and then treasury bonds you don't need to know what they are but treasury bonds 1500 they're a type of asset then on liabilities, demand deposits, basically it's holding us back a little bit, $5,000 we have to keep, owner's equity, $5,000, etc. And balance sheets should generally even out. Assets should generally equal liabilities. A demand deposit is simply the money deposited in a commercial bank using a checking account. So if you deposit $1,000, demand deposit would be $1,000. Required and excess reserve is simply the money that the bank keeps. Required reserves is the percent the bank must hold by law. So if the reserve requirement ratio, what we covered earlier, is 10%, and I deposited $1,000, the required reserve would be $100, because 10% times 1,000 is 100. Excess reserve is the amount that the bank can loan out, basically the extra. So if, I, if the res required reserve is $100, the excess reserve would be $900. And then the balance sheet is just a record of banks' assets, liabilities, and their total net worth. Now let's talk about the money market graph. 
you might see this occasionally in this unit, is basically graphing the demand and supply of money. On the x-axis, we have the quantity of money, how much money is in circulation, and then on the y-axis, we have the nominal interest rate, not the real interest rate, the nominal interest rate. This is the money demand graph. It's basically the demand for money. What we generally see is that the higher the nominal interest rate, the higher the interest rate is, the less demand there is overall. Why is this? Well, if there's a higher interest rate, that disincentivizes loaning out money. That disincentivizes getting loans, which overall harms the economy because it's more expensive. So higher nominal interest rates, lower demand, and then, um, sorry, lower interest rates is higher demand. This is the money supply graph, simply how much money overall there is. It's typically fixed. It stays the exact same. The quantity of money is always the same. And then this is our equilibrium. That's how much quantity and that's how much demand overall there will be for money at a specific interest rate. There are three main shifters for demand that you need to know. Changes in price level, changes in income, changes in technology. All three of which change our demand for money. If there's higher prices, there will be less demand. Lower prices, higher demand. That's just gen a general principle for demand. If there's higher prices, you're going to have less demand overall, specifically for money. Same with lower prices. Let's say you have higher income. That means you have more demand. Lower income, you have less demand. Then changes in technology. Overall, if we're more developed or if more technology, there will be more demand. Less technology, less demand. So these are the three main demand shifters, almost the same as, per, as usual in microeconomics or unit three of macro. Just like fiscal policy, the central bank of the U.S. uses the monetary policy to basically stabilize our economy, control our economy to, from recession and inflation by changing the money supply graph. So how do they do this? They use three main mechanisms, the reserve requirement, discount rate, and then open market operations. A lot of economics teachers, both online and in person, teach all three of these really in depth, but for the AP test, you really don't need to know what a discount rate or the open market operation is. You just really need to know that it exists that it, and how it works, for instance. So let's talk about these three. First, let's understand expansionary and contractionary fiscal monetary policy. It's very similar to fiscal policy. Expansionary monetary policy shifts money supply to the right. Contractionary monetary policy shifts to the left. So contractionary contracts the money supply. Expansionary expands the money supply. If we're in a recession, for instance, or our economic growth is really low, the central bank will want expansionary money supply because then there's more money. There's more demand for money, and thus we're going to see more exchanges, and the economy starts to boom. So just remember, expansionary monetary policy expands. It almost fuels the economy. But let's say we're going through inflation, or there's really bad inflation going on, hyper, hyper, hyperinflation. Well, then we want contractionary monetary policy. That kind of slows down the economy, contracts the economy. There's three main things you need to know. Higher reserve requirements contracts the economy. Selling bonds from open market operation, that contracts the economy. And then higher rates on discount rate, that contracts the money supply. Then a lower reserve requirement expands money supply. Buying bonds, that's expansionary. And then lower rates, discount rate also expands. So you need to know, does increasing or decreasing the reserve requirement, does that lead to more or less? Does that lead to expanding the money supply or contracting the money supply? Same with open market operations and the discount rate. You just need to know all six of these mainly. And then you need to understand, does it expand or does it contract? And what exactly are we going to do if it expands or contracts? Talking about our last topic, which is loanable funds. It's basically our savings and also borrowing of loanable money. So let's first talk about savings. There's different types of savings, private, public, and national. Private savings is the amount that households, so individuals, save instead of consume. So if I save $10,000 in my bank, that's private savings. Public savings is the amount that the government saves instead of spends. And a national savings is the overall savings, so the public plus private. So remember, private is individuals or households, public is the government, national is overall. 
and then changing this will change the supply of loanable funds, which is what we're about to cover. Yes, it's another supply and demand graph. This is the loanable funds market. The supply is people, lenders are savers, so people basically supplying loanable funds. And then demand is borrowers or investors, so people taking out loanable funds. There's a few main differences between this and the money market graph. On a money market graph, it's quantity of money. Here is quantity of loanable funds. On the y-axis here, we have the real interest rate. Money market, it's nominal interest rate. So this is the main difference. Nominal interest rate here in the money market graph, this is real interest rate. Make sure you notice that. And of course, we can shift both of these graphs. Demand shifts based on changing different things with borrowing or saving. So for instance, changing and in borrowing from consumers. If consumers need to borrow more, they're going to shift demand to the right. Businesses, let's say businesses want more money to invest or more capital they need to expand, then they're going to loan out, they need, they're going to take out more loans, shift to the right. And even the government with deficit spending. Remember, deficit spending is basically the government spending more than a save. So let's say that the deficit increases, that means the government needs to take out more loans to cover its actual expenditures, so that shifts to the right. But we can also shift supply. To the, we can also shift supply. Changes in private and public savings, what we just covered, and also changes in foreign investment. So let's say that foreign investors start decreasing investment in our country. That means we have less supply for loanable funds, shift to the left or shift to the right. So now we've covered almost everything in this unit. I would say about 70% of this. Why didn't we cover 100%? Because I wanted to give a general overview of what you're going to see in your economics class come unit four or finance sector. So you understand what we're talking about when we're saying monetary policy, what we're talking about when we understand money markets or loanable funds, why we have money in the first place. If you want to get a five on AP exam, you're going to have to know more and more on this unit. You need to understand more intricacies on interest rates. You need to understand more in depth with why these three main ideas of money. You're going to have to understand M1 and M2 much better. You're going to have to understand fractional reserve banking a lot better. You're going to have to be able to see different bank balance sheets beyond just this. You need to understand the money market graph. You're going to have to know more and more about monetary policy more than we covered. The specific intricacies of open market operations and the discount rate. You're going to have to understand the loanable funds market. And there's even more graphs that we haven't actually covered. So there's a lot of content we didn't actually cover, but this is a general overview. If you want to learn more, in the link in the description, there's around 18 to 20 practice problems that not only go over everything that we just covered, but also problems with stuff we haven't actually covered. With all the knowledge you've learned from these seven topics, you should be able to get every single problem right. But at the very bottom of the Google Docs, there's an answer key that helps you understand every single topic, that helps you better understand monetary policy or different topics that we just covered. All of which are really useful, I really recommend if you truly want to understand all of this unit, because this is a big unit for AP Macro.